Okay, thank you. Uh, I just wanted to comment on the, we've been talking about the young people a lot today. Um, I agree um, with the, most of the sentiment. I want to point out that the overwhelming majority of the young people in this building today are pro-life. Uh, if you walk the halls, that was extremely apparent that yes, there were a lot of young people and the overwhelming majority of them were wearing blue and are pro-life. And uh, I think that's because an, a sleeping giant has been awakened. This bill has brought churches, community, uh, communities together. People that have never expressed interest in this, in this issue are expressing interest now. I've, I've noticed that in my personal life. Um, a real quick comment on uh, Representative Nesselbush, um, who commented that the people outside of Planned Parenthood um, are hecklers. I, um, I need to address that because uh, throughout the course of the day, there were many of those hecklers uh, that were here. Um, I would love to introduce Representative Nesselbush, or Senator Nesselbush, I'm sorry, um, to Eva. Uh, Eva is a three-year-old uh, from North Kingstown. Uh, she's beautiful. She exists today because there were hecklers outside Planned Parenthood. Two years ago, her parents walked in there. Three years ago, her parents walked in there. Uh, to have an abortion. They came out, they hugged us, they shook our hands, they cried, and they thanked us for being out there. So thank God for the hecklers outside of Planned Parenthood. Let's cut through some of this. I'm going to talk, I, I, I really want you to pay attention to the last thing I'm going to say, um, and I'm going to lead up to that, because it gets to the heart of the constitutionality of this bill. There are 700,000 abortions every year. Okay, 90% of those abortions are done in the first trimester. 8% of those abortions are done between weeks 14 and 20. And 2% of those abortions are done between 21 weeks and 40 weeks. That accounts for 14,000 14, late-term abortions. This is important because all throughout the course of this day, all the Planned Parenthood people, all the pro-choice people, they kept repeating, these don't happen. These late-term abortions, they don't really happen. This is sort of some facade that the pro-life community has cooked up. We're talking about theoretical medicine all of a sudden. No, 14,000, and we know it's a lot more because California doesn't even report how many they do. 14,000 each year between 21 and 40 weeks. Okay, that's point number one. The reasons for those 14,000 abortions. No one has said this. They are identical to the reasons women get abortions in the first trimester. I have three sources to back that up, and you will never hear anybody from the other side deny that with statistics on why women get the 14,000 abortions in the third trimester. They are identical to the reasons women get abortions in the first trimester. They are largely economic reasons, lifestyle reasons, relationship reasons. They are not for fetal abnormalities and life of the mother. Those account for two to 5%, the same as the first trimester. If you think that's a faulty statistic, I have three sources that I can send to you and ask the other side to show statistics on why women get third trimester abortions. So they happen, so late-term abortions happen, 14,000 a year. They happen for lifestyle, economic, and relationship reasons primarily. And they are never, ever necessary for the life and health of the mother. You simply induce the pregnancy or call for an emergency C-section if a, if, a if a child in the third trimester needs to come out, those 14,000 abortions. They happen. They happen for lifestyle reasons, just like the first trimester abortions, and they're never medically necessary. Okay. And th the final point there is that those abortions, those 14,000 late-term abortions, they'll start happening more and more in Rhode Island. That's what we've seen in other states. They start to happen more in Rhode Island. So here is the key part. There is a constitutional lawyer in Rhode Island. Her name is Diane McGee. Diane McGee is 23 years in private practice. 
She's licensed in Rhode Island, Massachusetts, before the federal courts, before the U.S. Supreme Court. She is an adjunct faculty professor of law for 13 years at the university level, currently at Northeastern University. She uh, practices in areas of, uh, of include litigation and appellate practice. She serves as a private attorney on the appellate panel for the Massachusetts Committee for Public Counsel. Here is what she says about the health exception in this bill. Please pay attention to this. <coughs> Senator McKenney, Senator Archambault, please pay attention to this. The word health, as written in this bill, is ambiguous and imprecise and does not comport with the United States Supreme Court case of Roe v. Wade and its progency. Some vagueness provides, such vagueness provides solid grounds to support the argument that the entire statute is unconstitutional and void on its face. In order to understand how Roe and its progency define health, you must look at the totality of the statutes each case presents and the scope of the use of the word health Justice Blackman acknowledges in his dissent in Planned Parenthood versus Casey the limitations of a woman's liberty interest in her psychological health relative to abortion. Justice Blackman, who by the way wrote the opinion in Roe for the Supreme Court, wrote this, Appellants and some Amici courts argue that the woman's right is absolute and that she is entitled to terminate her pregnancy at whatever time, in whatever way, and for whatever reason she chooses. With this, we do not agree. Doe v. Bolton does not provide sufficient foundation for the bill's vague and ambiguous use of the word health. First, Doe reaffirmed that a woman's constitutional right to abortion is not absolute. In Doe, the word health was used in the context of the physician exercising his medical judgment relative to the protection of the woman's life and the procedure to be formed, the doctor taking into consideration physical, emotional, psychological, familial, and the woman's age, which are relevant to the well-being of the patient. A full and accurate reading of Doe versus Bolton does not suggest a woman may choose abortion for her psychological health alone. This bill, in other words, does not resemble the Georgia statute that's in, that is based on Doe Bolton at all and is plainly contrary to both the letter and spirit of the law of Roe v. Wade and its progency. In other words, the abortion lobby has been lying through its teeth for the last six months, saying that all this does is codify Roe v. Wade. They're either ignorant or they're lying. It's not true, and they kept it ambiguous for a reason. And it goes beyond Roe v. Wade in six other ways, which I'm not gonna bore you with. You know what they are. And I'll tell you this, I hope you walked through the State House today because it was overwhelmingly blue. And if you vote for this thing, I guarantee you, we're coming for your seats and we're gonna get them. Thank you.